Good afternoon. Uh, very happy today to have uh, Professor uh, Isaiah Bolton joining us here from the, uh, Georgia Tech, where he has been a professor for all of 30 days. <laughs> So Dr. Bolton got his uh, bachelor's uh, at Bowdoin College. He's originally from uh, Nashville, Tennessee, but he uh, went up to Maine, uh, got his uh, bachelor's at Bowdoin, uh, went on to work at the University of Washington, where he got his PhD in 2020, working with Alexander Gagnon. Uh, and then he did a postdoc at Vanderbilt in the midst of COVID, which we're good. Right. Um, and as I said, just just now joined the faculty at Georgia Tech University. Uh, Dr. Bolton works on uh, coral reef ecosystems using a, a number of innovative uh, geochemical proxies to try to understand uh, biogeochemical cycling, nutrient cycles, and the like. Uh, and today he's going to tell us about biogeochemical fingerprints, uh, changes in coral reefs across space and time. So thank you very much. Take away. Hello. Thank you, oh. <laughs> thank you guys. Um, can everybody hear me okay? We're good? Awesome. Uh, thank you, John, for that awesome introduction. Um, and yeah, like it's super excited to have you all here. Thank you for coming to listen to this spiel on biogeochemical fingerprints of change in coral reefs across space and time. Um, and this is a like very like wordy title, uh, but it really gets at the crux of why I really like studying these ecosystems. And of course, don't get me wrong, going to a tropical coral reef on a nice cold day like today sounds really great. Um, but it's react in actuality, what gets me excited and out of bed every morning about studying these dynamic environments is that they provide a very cool playground for us to explore the nexus and the intersection of a variety of different topics in geochemistry, paleoclimatology, ecology, um, basically like the really true investigations of how whole ecosystem processes manifest in one particular kind of marine environment and how you can track that through space and time. And so with that, I feel more like a detective than a geochemist, and so I brand this as CSI for coral reefs. So uh, my goal with the next 50 minutes or so is to kind of give you a couple of different vignettes to kind of tease how I go about thinking about solving ecological questions in coral reef environments over these time scales. But to kind of start, I always try to start a lecture like this where you know it's a broad geochemist or broad geoscience background um, or audience. Uh, and here we are in Texas and I'm based in Atlanta, both of us far away from the nearest coral reef. What are corals? And this is the audience interactive part of the talk. Um, but there are three choices here, animals, plants, or rocks. So just show of hands, how many people think corals are animals? Great. How many people think corals are plants? OK, a couple people. How many people think they're rocks? OK, great. You are all correct. Yay. Um, so this is corals are all three of these organisms, basic or all three of these kinds of things. Um, when you look at a coral reef picture, or if you've had the pleasure of going to a coral reef environment yourself, you probably see an image that looks very similar to this, right? Very clear blue water, lots of vibrant colors that are kind of showing out um, throughout the reef landscape. Lots of very intricate shapes and sizes of different coral heads. Large fishery sustains, so lots of different organisms kind of calling the reef home. Uh, but what you're really looking at if you were to zoom in at any given one of these coral heads are hundreds to thousands of tiny individual coral animals called polyps. And these polyps work colonially to build or precipitate this massive calcium carbonate skeleton. So you've got these animal parts working colonially to build this rock part, the skeleton of coral. And if you were to zoom in any given one of these coral heads even closer to get an idea of what the morphology of what an individual polyp looks like, you'd see something that looks like this, an upside down jellyfish. Um, and that's actually because corals are actually cousins to modern day jellyfish. Um, they have these central tentacles surrounding a, a mouth that they kind of use to filter things into their gut. And these tentacles actually do have nematocysts, so they can sting you. Well, if they can sting prey and capture that free-floating prey in the water column um, to be able to fuel the growth and supply the energy to the growth of this calcium carbonate skeleton. But if you were to zoom even closer into one individual polyp, and again, there are hundreds of thousands of, thousands of individual polyps in one coral colony, you would see, as this image is alluding to, thousands to millions of single cell dinoflagellates, these algae that photosynthesize and actually provide 90% or more of the energy responsible for coral reef growth to the coral uh, animal itself. So you've got this algae-like part, this plant-like part photosynthesizing and passing the majority of the sugars produced during photosynthesis to the gut of the coral to fuel the growth of the skeleton part. Plant, animal, rock, right? 
Um, and so it's clear then that reefs as ecosystems are very complex. Um, this complexity lends itself really well to reefs being considered, the modern reefs at least, being considered the rainforest of the ocean. So they house 25% of the planet's entire marine biodiversity and less than one-tenth of one percent of the surface area cover of the ocean. That's a lot of life crammed into not a lot of space, right? Um, and that life and the ecosystem services basically that reefs uh, provide has no shortages, right? Um, one in every 10 fish consumed around the world, believe it or not, whether we're in Atlanta or we're in Austin, statistically speaking, comes from a coral reef environment. Um, hundreds of millions of people depend on the actual fishery sustained by coral reefs for their uh, cultural livelihood. Um, from a physical perspective, because you have this massive calcium carbonate framework, um, lots of tropical storms and cyclones, as they make their way to low-lying uh, low island nations, they encounter the reef framework before they actually make landfall and dissipate a lot of their energy along those rocky substrates. Um, from the perspective of studying ancient climates, we also can derive a lot from modern reef ecosystems. And that's because as coral reefs are building their calcium carbonate skeletons, they do so in annual rings like trees grow in rings, as illustrated by this webcomic by a friend of mine, Sasha Saroy, who leads this interviews with invertebrates. I recommend you all check it out. It's pretty funny. Um, but basically, this is one she designed that kind of highlights some of the things I'm interested in. Um, as corals build their calcium carbonate skeletons, they record it in annual bands that are density driven, but because seawater is not a pure mixture of calcium ions and carbonate ions, other stuff can get substituted into this matrix, and we're able to use the ratio of that other stuff to calcium to basically tell us something about past changes in climate for where this coral has been growing. We're going to come back to this later on in the talk. I just wanted to tease a little bit right now. Um, now, that complexity that leads to all those ecosystem services that modern day reefs provide comes at a cost. Modern day reef ecosystems thrive in very delicate circumstances. They require very narrow range of temperature and very pristine seawater chemistry. Now, we know that fossil fuel emissions of CO2 have been exponentially increasing since the Industrial Revolution, driving global climate change in terms of uh, greenhouse, um, greenhouse uh, warming, um, global warming, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and basically kind of layering on too much of a blanket in greenhouse gases are kind of trapping excess heat. But it turns out that the chemistry of the ocean is also becoming less pristine because the CO2 doesn't just stay in the atmosphere. Oh, sorry. I'm also highlighting this, uh, this change in global temperature here. Um, so that's the primary CO2 problem is global warming. But that CO2 doesn't just stay in the atmosphere. Um, the other CO2 problem, as it's called in the literature, is ocean acidification, where a lot of that emitted fossil fuel CO2 is actually sucked up by the ocean, the surface ocean, which is trying to maintain its buffering capacity and modulate the changes that's going on in the atmosphere. But what happens when CO2 dissolves in seawater is a series of complex chemical reactions that ultimately end up in the generation of protons, so the seawater becomes more acidic, and you end up consuming carbonate ion from seawater so the ocean maintains its buffering capacity, right? Now keep in mind, the ocean is doing its job to try to mitigate against CO2, um, uh, a, a, a runaway CO2 emission in the atmosphere and kind of mitigate its chemistry change in the ocean, but the cost is that corals and other marine calcifiers that build calcium carbonate have less carbonate ion around to actually precipitate their skeletons, right? So as you can see here, as you increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and by extension in the ocean, you decrease the availability of carbonate ion, which makes a bad day worse for corals and other marine calcifiers. Um, in some cases, we're actually worried about getting to a point where the saturation or the availability of carbonate in the ocean in some places getting to the point where we're gonna start dissolving solid calcium carbonate back into solution, right? So not great. So we know that the chemistry of the ocean is changing. We know that the oceans are warming. Two things that corals really care about. It's really no surprise then that a lot of the literature right now and a lot of pop media outlets are saying that Coral reefs around the world are in a state of global decline. I'm sure that's something that a lot of you, even though we're in Austin, have heard about, right? They're not doing so hot right now. Um, and here are just some headlines grabbed from media outlets showcasing that such fact, with some even going as far as to write obituaries for entire ecosystems like the Great Barrier Reef. Um, now, keep in mind, the Great Barrier Reef is about the size of Japan. So we're at the point of writing obituaries for Japan-sized ecosystems. Uh, that's going to send the world of people like me who are interested in really understanding the ecosystem dynamics and the persistence um, in terms of biogeochemical cycling and metabolism of reef environments um, into a frenzy with people really trying to understand the rate of this decline for any given reef ecosystem in the world and what we can try to do to get ahead of it and mitigate it if possible. 
And when we start to look at ecosystem scale studies, um, transcending like culture studies in the lab and, and getting out to like what's actually going on in the actual environment, um, we start to get a really interesting picture of what this decline might actually look like. So this is a figure that's coming from a study that was conducted in 2018 where they tried to simulate the effects of ocean acidification on reef community composition. So who are the key players that are kind of driving the composition of the reef as you get closer to a natural volcanic CO2 seep, so a natural source of CO2 that is simulating the effects of what we expect to be in the end of century with terms of atmospheric CO2. So for reference, in the atmosphere right now, we are about, we're close to 400, it's like 417 four in, the, in the 14s, 420-ish range. Um, and 900 is where, we're, between 900 and 1100 is where we're expected to be in the atmosphere by the end of this century. Um, now, there are two things that I want you to take away from a figure that looks like that, from, from this figure, right? The first is that you can notice as you increase your proximity to the natural volcanic CO2 seep and your CO2 concentrations increase, the reef is still teeming with life. It's just the second thing, that life looks very different, right? And this has kind of caused people like me to really go back and look at the literature in a different way and say, maybe reefs aren't so much in a state of decline as much as they are in a state of transition. The reefs of the future, the reefs of 2100, will probably look and function very differently than the reefs of today, right? Um, and because of studies like this that kind of looked at ecosystem scale processes, we know kind of what to expect in that transition to an alternative stable state, right? So as a function of increasing sea surface temperature and decreasing pH and decreasing carbonate availability or saturation state, we're looking at a decline away from marine calcifiers such as corals and crustose coral and algae, which you can kind of think of as, you know, you've, you've seen pictures of the big corals, but the glue that holds everything together that kind of fills in the cracks are these purely calcifying algae, these photosynthetic algae um, that, are, that are pretty cool, right? So like you've got these corals, you've got this algae that cements the whole reef framework together. We're gonna come back to that, so keep that in mind. Other kind of calcifying algae, shellfish, anything that builds a calcium carbonate hard part is gonna transition away towards a dominance of fleshy macroalgae. So green slime that like photosynthesizes and might not perform the same ecological role as corals in terms of that habitat suitability that gives them that rainforest structure. Um, and while it sounds easier on the ears to think about coral, coral reefs being in a state of transition rather than complete decline, it's the coral dominated reefs of today that give us all the ecosystem services that we depend on. So if this is indeed the community shift that we're expected to see in reef ecosystems in the future, what we need are tools that transcend uh, traditional measurements um, and tell us ideas for where any given reef lies on this transition line from coral dominated to macroalgae dominated, if that's a particular stable state that it's headed towards. And since we also know that the community composition is changing, it's not just about knowing the magnitude of how productive or how calcified a particular reef is, but something that's more nuanced and telling us who, so to speak, are the contributing members of the seafloor community and how is that shifting over time. And these tools need to be designed in a way that complements the strengths and limitations of traditional measurements of metabolism in the reef environment. So for decades, people have been going out and making measurements of pH, so how acidic the ocean is, oxygen variability, which responds to photosynthesis and respiration, as does dissolved inorganic carbon, which you can kind of think of as the total amount of inorganic carbon in, in seawater that derives from CO2, so how much CO2 is in seawater. Total alkalinity, which you can also think of as kind of a measure of that buffering capacity, the ability for oceans to resist changes in pH, which itself is modulated by things taking in calcium carbonate and releasing it back out. You can imagine if you measure all of these things or a subset of these things, you could build a plot like this, which is data from uh, a study that I, one, one of my studies, um, which is showcasing the heartbeat of a reef ecosystem over just a 24 hour cycle. So these are very dynamic environments where you can see here I've plotted in, in green oxygen concentrations and in brown dissolved inorganic carbon or dissolved CO2 concentrations and they are the inverse because during the day you have photosynthesis which produces oxygen and consumes carbon, inorganic carbon, and at night you have a system switch where you start producing CO2 and you start consuming car or oxygen, right? Um, and basically you can imagine that if you build a curve for this um, through for a day, for a season, for interannual variability, you can start to construct net ecosystem rates of productivity and calcification, right? Like how much growth, how much productivity is any given reef seeing in a particular amount of time. Um, but again, uh, first of all, there are a lot of things that you can measure and it would be great to be able to figure out a subset of things to measure to kind of give us the most bang for our buck data we can get for any reef in the world if we try to 
trying to build a comprehensive data set. But even if we could measure a couple of these things and get these net rates, we still get back to the original problem, which is they give us the flux, the magnitude, but not the identity of who's doing what. And remember, the who is also important as we move forward in a more stressful environment, right? And so uh, that's where my CSI forensic geochemistry approach to figuring out answers to this kind of thing kind of comes in. Um, in addition to these two key questions of where does any reef lie on this line and who are the contributing members of the C4 community, I've kind of also expanded it since my time in graduate school to incorporate a few different things um, or a few more questions. Second, or the third, is how has the climate and the ecology of the reef changed over time? So what can we learn from the paleo record in reef environments to give us a very comprehensive understanding of how stable or unstable a particular reef ecosystem has been over time? And then once we have this full suite of modern and ancient data, what can we then do to give to reef managers to mitigate and adapt to these changing environments on the reef, right? What can we do move forward for adaptation strategies? And so what I would like to spend the rest of the time doing is kind of focusing in on a few like subsets of these questions um, uh, to give you a little bit more of a teaser in terms of um, how I go about doing these kinds of things. So I'll focus first on who are the contributing members of the C4 community and a question or a kind of approach you could go about um, answering that question for a particular type of calcifying environment. Okay, so who are the contributing members of the C4 community on the reef and how is that community changing with time? From the calcifier community on a reef perspective, this is an important question because here we are again, I've shown you this plot, this layout kind of before, where we're expected to go from calcifier dominance to macroalgae dominance for many reefs by the end of the century. Turns out that when you look at a coral reef, everything that's calcifying is building calcium carbonate, but it turns out that different things on the reef that are making calcium carbonate make different polymorphs or flavors of calcium carbonate. For example, the crustose corona algae, which again is the cement that kind of holds the reef framework together, the glue kind of, makes a flavor called high magnesium calcite, and corals, which you're familiar with, make a flavor called aragonite. These flavors have different mineral structures, they have different chemical properties and whatnot, but for the sake of this talk and why it's important to think about kind of community composition, in a more acidic ocean, the glue that holds everything together is actually more soluble than what corals are actually making. And while that's good to know just for the sake of knowing, oh, okay, well, there might be some kind of like, you know, maybe corals aren't, aren't, uh, aren't we've got some time with corals. Um, but again, this is the stuff that's providing structural integrity to the reef, right? And so beyond knowing just how much calcification is going on in a reef from a numbers perspective, just from a magnitude perspective, it would also be great if we had some kind of complementary tool that told us the balance of glue to coral for monitoring how stable the reef is or isn't becoming with time, right? And then once we had that tool, if we're able to develop it, we can come back to the same reef or go to a different reef and track over different spatial and temporal scales how calcifier diversity on the reefs with respect to the balance of coral or respect to the balance of glue to coral um, is changing as a function of increasing PCO2, decreasing saturation state, increasing sea surface temperatures, right? So how do we go about building such a tool that can give us this fingerprint of who is doing what from a calcifier perspective as a function of increasing stressors? Well, we'll start with the idea that calcium carbonate formation from seawater is a pretty imperfect process. So as I said before, when we're talking about how corals are building their skeleton from the soupy mix of seawater, there's a lot of other stuff dissolved in seawater besides calcium ions and carbonate ions. To illustrate that point, here's our vat of imaginary seawater. We're gonna fill it with some calcium ions. We're gonna fill it with some carbonate ions. And then for illustrative purposes, an element that behaves a lot like calcium, strontium. If you guys are familiar with like genchem and things like that, you remember elements in the same group have similar chemical behaviors. This is that process at work. Um, so with that said, if you imagine a coral or any kind of marine calcifier trying to build or precipitate a calcium carbonate skeleton, they're usually trying to grab a calcium ion and a carbonate ion, bond them together like this. But because there's some strontium dissolved in seawater and strontium behaves a lot like calcium, sometimes you make strontium carbonate instead. And this is actually fundamental to the idea of us being able to use the strontium calcium ratio in coral skeletons as a paleothermometer because this process is actually thermodynamically regulated. It responds to temperature. During cooler temperatures, you have more strontium substitution in place of calcium. And so you have higher strontium calcium ratios in coral skeletons when it's colder outside. And if you look at a coral skeleton, you see really cool wiggles. That's something you should know, but not the crux of this talk. 
What's important for this talk is the fact that everything that's making calcium carbonate on the reef is doing this, but the flavors of calcium carbonate discriminate against strontium uptake in very different ways. Another way of saying that mathematically is that the partition coefficient, or the KD, so the equilibrium constant for partitioning, of strontium into the calcium carbonate matrix of a coral um, is very different between high magnesium calcite and aragonite. And so, if you're with me thus far, we're going to continue and model a day's worth of calcification between these two different flavors of polymorph flavors or polymorphs of calcium carbonate. So we've got Presto's coralline algae, which again is the glue that holds everything together, the, the key structural integrity um, uh, component of the reef, and the corals, which are kind of like the apartment buildings themselves, the things that people, the things that people, the things that uh, organisms kind of live and colonize around. And this is the more soluble flavor. This is the less soluble flavor. Partition coefficient wise. Crustose coral and algae is actually more discriminatory against strontium uptake. Its partition coefficient is on between 0.1, or, yeah, 0.1 and 0.45, which means that as we are building our skeleton, if we are crustose coral and algae, we are going to contain less strontium, and that means that we're rejecting strontium out of our matrix, so the seawater strontium calcium ratio actually increases. We are keeping that impurity out of our matrix. If we are corals, we're pretty close to one, if not slightly above one, which means compared to CCA, Crustose Coral and Algae, our skeleton contains relatively more strontium, and that means that the straight seawater strontium calcium ratio doesn't change very much at all, if not slightly decreased because there's a slight preference for strontium uptake into the skeleton versus the solution phase, the dissolved phase. Now, again, what we're after, kind of taking a step back, is some kind of biogeochemical fingerprint that tells us an ecological perspective of how things on the reef are calcifying and dissolving and who's doing what. The fact that after a day's worth of calcification or a season's worth of calcification, the seawater strontium calcium ratio is kind of manifesting or integrating all that signature between the two is that exact fingerprint that we're looking for. And so in addition to going and measuring um, pH, dissolving organic carbon, oxygen, all that other stuff I showed that elucidates kind of a heartbeat signal in terms of metabolism in modern reef environments. I think that reef seawater should also be recording community level calcification dynamics, meaning that if you were to go to uh, a really nice coral environment that has some kind of breakdown that you're not really sure about the breakdown in terms of composition of coral to out calcifying algae, um, this is Tetura Atoll. It's about 30 miles north of the island of Tahiti in French Polynesia. Um, Fun fact, I don't really know, like, how many of you guys know who Marlon Brando is? Like, have we, have we gone past that point? Yeah, okay. Uh, no, he was the original godfather, and he owned this island. Um, and so I always used to joke about whenever I showed this picture, it's like, it was an offer we couldn't refuse um, to be able to do work here. But in any case, you go to this really pristine atoll, um, and it's got some balance of corals and crustose coral and algae inside of it, and you want to quantify what that value is. If you were to measure it the same, if you were to measure strontium calcium ratios or sample for strontium calcium ratios in CUR the same way that you sample for oxygen and all that other stuff that we've been doing for decades, it should be recording the balance of polymorphs and community uh, calcification and tell you something about the percent contributions of these guys versus this guy. And then further, if you were to not only make those measurements of what the strontium calcium ratio values were, but also apply a Rayleigh distillation model to them, I hope this doesn't scare anybody. It's actually not as scary as it looks. Basically, what we're getting at is making enough strontium calcium measurements between open ocean conditions and what you're measuring on the reef to back out what the net value, what this net partition coefficient is in your reef ecosystem. And if you have this value, this is KD net that I'm calling, you could compare it to either of these and basically break it down into what percent contribution you have from either of the end members, right? You with me? Can we quantitatively isolate these signals? I always put this in here uh, because it turns out that just because theoretically, you know, like you hypothesize that um, there are things that you can measure in seawater, it turns out oftentimes you're looking for a needle in a haystack in terms of where we are from just an analytical perspective and the kind of hoops you have to jump through. But thankfully, working with John and where's Aaron? Aaron, um, uh, there are crucial uh, uh, components of helping me be able to get to um, a point where we can use thermalization mass spectrometry and uh, really intense double mixed spike isotope dilution techniques. I'd be happy to talk to anybody who's interested about the more nitty gritty details about that. 
Um, but basically, you'd be able to measure these these kind of small changes in strontium calcium ratios in seawater with pretty 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 decent precision, um, and be able for the first time to show, indeed, that strontium calcium ratios in seawater temporally vary within coral reef ecosystems over a diel cycle, the same way that you make measurements of alkalinity and and DIC. Um, now, what I'm showing right here, just for illustrative purposes, is salinity normalized alkalinity, which is another heartbeat that we think is. Indic indicative of how things are calcifying or dissolving. So you've got light enhanced calcification during the day, drawing down alkalinity, and you've got some respiration driven uh, dissolution at night. So you've got this really nice heartbeat signal in alkalinity that comes back down during the day. For the first time, I present to you, strontium calcium does the same thing, which is pretty cool. Um, and like the size of the signals, even with these error bars, is easily resolved, which is, which is phenomenal. It's great. Um, and so what's, what's What's interesting is that, like you know, we think that it's mostly driven by calcification, but it doesn't necessarily have the same pattern in terms of it's hard to see a bit laser pointer, but the same pattern of drawdown as alkalinity does. And you know, there are nuances with all of these kind of interesting proxies, but the overall crux is that you have this drawdown during the day and this increase at night. You've got this really cool diel cycle, and the fact that it's going down during the day and up during the night is kind of an indicator of like what side of that partition coefficient we're leaning towards for the ecosystem. Well, we'll come back to that in a second because I want to show you the same data in a slightly different way to illustrate something that might be important for the people that might be interested in paleoceanographic reconstructions. So here's this plot, and now here's this plot again, but instead of the rightmost y-axis being the raw strontium calcium values, I plot them relative to change in the open ocean value. So if this is your open ocean value of 8.53, and the open ocean is important because it's like the source waters of the reef. All the reef, all the waters on the reef are derived from these open ocean waters that atop the reef and flow towards the central lagoon. If all of our water starts off at the zero point, there's a couple of things I want you to notice. The first is that we are sitting up to a 2% offset from open ocean seawater on the coral reef ecosystem, right? So like just the baseline mean and the maximum amplitude of the signal that we see over the course of a day in the coral reef is if it's up to a 2% up to a 2% offset from open ocean seawater. And even inside the reef itself, there's up to a 1% cycle relative to open ocean seawater in C2, right? So we've got this heartbeat signal that is below what the open ocean is telling us. Now, I told you a while ago that a lot of people depend on the strontium calcium ratio of, sea of uh, coral reef skeletons um, as a proxy for paleo temperature. That assumption that we can use that is dependent on the fact that we think or we, that, well, the, that the ability for us to make that assumption is dependent on another assumption that strontium calcium ratios in seawater are relatively time invariant. Here I'm showing for the first time that in a single coral reef, the exact places that you're sampling these skeletons from to build this paleoceanography record, um, you see up to a 2% or uh, between a 1% and 2% offset from open ocean conditions. So if you're assuming your value of open ocean seawater is this, and in the reef it's actually somewhere down here, what you might actually sample in your coral reef skeleton could be you would interpret as a temperature signal of up to maybe one to three degrees Celsius, when in reality it's that your source water composition isn't what you thought it was. So it's the same kind of problem, like for those of you that might know anything about oxygen isotopes in seawater. We also use oxygen isotopes in coral skeletons and other calcifying organisms as a paleothermometer, but we also need to know the seawater value of delates of, of the oxygen composition of seawater value, basically, in addition to the temperature side. Here I'm arguing that we might need to start thinking about that for the strontium calcium side as well. It's not as, the strontium calcium paleothermometer might not be as robust to just recording temperature as we thought it was, if that makes sense. Okay, so yeah, I sum that up by saying non-conservative behavior, major implications potentially for strontium calcium paleothermometry, our ability to use it as a past climate archive uh, for temperature. But getting back to kind of the central thrust of the argument of trying to find a fingerprint that tells us something about the balance between corals and crustose coral and algae. Um, we can take our measurements of strontium calcium ratios from seawater, run them this scary looking equation, and calculate what the KD net value is for every point that we have a measurement for strontium calcium ratios. And we elucidate a couple of things from that, right? We get these partition coefficients, like we get the pattern of partition coefficient behavior throughout the day, which is cool because it looks like you know it might trend up a little bit during the day, like we have the most calcification, um, and also like photosynthesis at its highest, so you have the most alkaline conditions on the reef, um, and then you might start trending down again at night when things get a little bit more respiratory and high in CO2 and low in pH, 
and then you know there's some kind of interesting behavior throughout or in between but basically the key takeaway here is that our average value over the course of the day for this particular dial cycle is 0.98 plus or minus 0.1 which if i give you your in members again this number is very close to that number which suggests for right now that this particular ecosystem tetura atoll and french polynesia is consistent with a hundred percent aragonite domination of uh corals or sorry aragonite domination of nec net ecosystem calcification corals are doing most of the work in this ecosystem right now still but now that we have this tool that we can apply um not only can we break it down hourly per hour or hour per hour and figure out kind of well how this balance shifting at different points of the day we can come back to the same reef ecosystem at a different point in time and apply this two-member mixing equation basically that says that any kd net value you get has some component that is x or fra some fraction of calcite times the kd for calcite plus some fraction of aragonite times the kd for aragonite and then this equation combined with this data is how you would then be able to take this number if it wasn't 0.98 or very close to one of those end members and get the exact percent contribution of who's doing what for a day's worth of calcification or a season's worth of calcification so that's really cool. So we've developed a fingerprint that can kind of help us track variability in calcifier community composition um, as a function of stressors, as a function of time, space, what have you. Um, and that's really exciting. Okay, so to kind of pop back out and give you kind of a bit of a conclusion uh, chunk to, to process, I'd now like to talk about a little bit of the postdoctoral work and work that I'm kind of projecting for the future. Um, in terms of how has the climate and the ecology of the reef changed over time and bringing in some of that kind of paleo ecosystem scale um, uh, uh, collaborations and thinking about what can we learn from the paleo system um, in these environments that helps project our, or that helps uh, enhance our understanding of where they're headed in the future. All right. Yep. And the reason I think that this is an important question to ask is because You've seen numerous headlines, as I've shown you before, about like how everybody's writing about reefs in the world, across the world are in an unprecedented state of decline. It's all doom and gloom. However, in the same world that we have uh, declining reefs like this, I guess I could have put these, well, yeah, so like every reef in the world is basically going from pristine to being degraded. But right now we have Pacific reefs and reefs all over the world, not just in the Pacific, some even in the Caribbean basin that are absolutely thriving. And we also have reefs like in the Florida Keys they're doing pretty poorly, right? So if every reef is headed towards this system of degradation um, by the end of the 20, uh, by like close to 2100, it's very clear to me that they're not all gonna get there at the same time because some are already there. Some don't look like they've ever even started that process. So how do these two reefs exist in the same temporal plane today given the same kind of background ocean acidification and background warming events that are happening? It has to be something a little bit more local than just global changes and global trends. So another way of saying that is like, what is the temporal path of climate or environmental change that results in a transition between very pristine and um, very degraded? Like what kind of sequence of events does a particular reef ecosystem have to go through to, and at what timing does events have to happen in order for it to become a degraded ecosystem? And then can we use paleoclimate clues basically to trade geographic space for time? And what I mean by that is, can we take advantage of the fact that there are numerous reef ecosystems today that are very pristine and there are numerous ecosystems today that are very degraded. Can we make the same kind of measurements that we've been doing in terms of the forensic geochemistry approach and compare the data that we get from here to here and also bring in the paleoclimate record to see how long a particular reef ecosystem has been stable or unstable um, to try and figure out what this path actually looks like. Can we chart a path for any given coral reef in the world? Now, how are we gonna get there? Well. We've talked a lot about corals acting as marine carbonate archives of past environmental variability. So you can drill a coral core, pull it up, slab it, x-ray it, um, drill powders from it, um, analyze those powders for geochemical variability. Can I say that here? Yeah. Coral skeleton, coral, coral skeleton, count and date the bands, analyze chemical changes in the skeleton to reconstruct past ocean climate variability, right? Um, particularly with regard to sea surface temperature conditions and sea surface salinity conditions, right? So we can get sea surface hydrology and temperature. There are certain places where we might be able to get complementary terrestrial carbonate archives of paleo precipitation. So how arid or how wet a particular environment has been over time. 
um, in a way that complements where we're getting the corals from. Like the same location, we can get aridity and temperature and really start to build out these records of a comprehensive ecosystem kind of perspective. Anybody want to take a guess for what are terrestrial archives I'm talking about? You do not have to know, but just curious. Yeah, I heard it, speleothems. Speleothems, terrestrial carbonate archives of past climate variability, right? So how many people are familiar with the term speleothem? All right, great. So these guys are made of the calcium carbonate as well in places where you have um, a limestone or calcium carbonate bedrock environment. You have rainfall um, absorbing a lot of atmospheric CO2. And of course, we talk about this from the ocean acidification perspective. When you dissolve CO2 into water, you make carbonic acid, it makes the water acidic. So that rainwater sucks up a lot of atmospheric CO2 and then percolates down into the soil where it absorbs a lot of soil respiratory CO2. So the roots of all these plants are respiring and it gets more CO2 added into the water. And then that water is now rather acidic and encounters calcium carbonate where it starts to dissolve that calcium carbonate and percolate its way through until it enters the roof of a cave environment where it has absorbed a lot of CO2 relative to the amount of CO2 in the cave. And so CO2 degasses from the water and you start precipitating or building calcium carbonate in the form of uh, a speleothem, a stalactite and stalagmite. So remember, tight top and mite bottom. Um, turns out that because this whole process is modulated by precipitation and how much rainfall you have and the amount of rainfall you have, um, you can actually cut a speleothem, slab it, uh, and do geochemical analysis across its bands after you've dated them to reconstruct terrestrial hydroclimate, right? And so that'd be really great if we found a place that had both corals and speleothems next to one another where you could be able to bring the two together, potentially, hopefully, even in the same temporal like axis, right? They cover the same time chunks and be able to build paleo records of temperature and aridity. Now I say that, and this is me in the top right corner here drilling a speleothem, so we found the place, right? Um, and that place has, has led me to change the title a little bit to CSI Caves and Coral Reefs. Um, but the, the island is Curacao, which is in the, uh, the Southern Caribbean, the very arid Southern Caribbean. It's very weird. Um, but yeah, so I say an arid tropical Caribbean paradise home to pristine modern coral reefs, some of the most pristine in the entire Caribbean, if not the whole world. Um, ancient fossilized reef terraces and numerous uh, carbonate platforms with actively precipitating speleothems. Um, when it comes to this fossilized reef terrace stuff, I want to highlight just a couple of pictures here. We were actually able to go to Curacao and do some preliminary field work earlier in May of this year as part of my postdoc. Um, and this is very cool because like, you can kind of see the landscape here. So ancient coral reef terraces. Like, these are terraces of ancient coral reef platforms that are recording where sea level used to be 500,000 years ago, 300,000 to 500,000 years ago. And then where we're standing right here is a lower terrace, which is last interglacial, 125,000 years ago. So when you're walking around Curacao, you're actually walking around staircases of ancient coral reef platforms, which is pretty cool. You look down at your feet, they're rocks, but they're not just any rocks, they're actually fossilized coral pieces, right? And these coral pieces, this is coral, like this coral stratigraphy basically, um, lends itself well to building a new carbonate platform to start precipitating speleothems from. So you get caves precipitating from recycled coral material that's no longer underwater anymore. It's a really interesting place. Um, and because of that, um, we decided to kind of put in a proposal to go down to Curacao and sample a few different cave environments, a bunch of modern day coral reefs and a bunch of fossilized uh, reef ecosystems, in addition to seawater, do a few different things. Uh, the first is to use the modern records to establish a modern baseline of daily, seasonal, and interannual Southern Caribbean variability and precipitation and aridity, right? Can we basically kind of get an idea of how the system is behaving now? And once we have that data, can we construct proxy calibration records um, or equations, rather, for generating novel semi-quantitative records of environmental change in this region. We've got a modern system that we can calibrate. We can build like records of how to interpret the paleo record. Can we look at climate variability for hundreds to thousands of years ago from both the speleothem side and the coral side and tell us about how warm and how arid Curacao has been to help us better understand why the, why the particular reefs of this ecosystem or why the particular reefs in this area are as pristine as they are and how long have they been that way. And then, of course, also, because this is an area of the world where it's not just a matter of thinking about, well, how wet or how dry is it or how hot or how cold is it, the climate overall is modulated really strongly by ocean climate interactions like uh, the intertropical convergence zone migration, the North Atlantic Oscillation, and El Nino Southern Oscillation, 
I'm sure many of you guys are familiar with those terms, but basically like major ocean climate interactions that are driving climate variability in this region that we think we might be able to reconstruct the records of those beyond just our Aridian temperature uh, uh, reconstructions using just the speleothems and everything. So like I said, we just submitted a proposal on that. It's my first like grown up proposal. I'm hopeful that it get funded, but even though like, um, uh, even if it doesn't, I'm just glad to have the experience or whatever, but yes, of course, I hope that it gets funded. So stay tuned for um, results from that, but like teasing you a little bit from data from our initial field campaign, um, we were able to collect at least a few dates from some of the samples we collected. Um, and the speleothem range gives us the confidence that we might be able to date things going back to the last, through the last glacial period. So um, uh, speleothems that cover up to 40,000 years ago, up through the mid Holocene, um, we know that there's a previously published record from Bon Air fossilized corals that span the mid Holocene. And we know, we, well, we think, well, sorry, we know that we can get uh, modern corals and Holocene age corals from Curacao. And we think that we might be able to even extend that record to last glacial corals um, from drowned reefs in the nearby region. So we think basically this is one playground in the world where you can get modern day calcification rates, modern day productivity rates, and paleo records of hydrology. Um, and sea surface temperature and seawater conditions at the ecosystem scale for the last 40,000 years. I think that that's pretty novel at the resolution that we will be able to reconstruct these kinds of things at. Okay, so to kind of conclude, um, I think that what I've shown you today is kind of backing out and recapping. Um, many corals in the world are supposed to be going from, or they're hypothesized to go from this coral dominated state to this macroalgae dominated state as a function of these key stressors, right? But my research has shown so far, based on the tools I've shown you today and some that I didn't get a chance to, that it's not that simple, right? Like this transition is gonna have a lot of subtle nuances that include going from stony coral dominated reefs to an alternative stable state that might include crustless coral and algae dissolution, which we talked about, maybe some coral dissolution, which we didn't get a chance to talk about, some change in algal diversity, which we didn't get a chance to talk about, and then maybe this is an alternative stable state towards fleshy macroalgae dominated reefs, which even then, this is not the only alternative stable state that many reefs are projected to head. Some are like sponge dominated. There are lots of different potential pathways. But the idea is that you can use chemistry, basically geochemical tools and forensic geochemical fingerprinting in the CSI type of way to really understand where any given reef is in this transition, right? And that's the central thrust of my research is trying to figure out like how can we use these tools in nuanced ways to really be able to get at what this ecosystem is doing at the level of what this community is doing at the level of the ecosystem through various instances of space and time. And again, why I think this is important is because even though I showed you this slide with all the doom and gloom, there is a lot of hope in this transition, right? Here are some, um, some of the like, more positive uh, uh, headlines taken from um, uh, media outlets, like moonshot for coral breeding was successful, uh, coral cover on parts of the Great Barrier Reef highest in decades, right? Um, can Red Sea corals, where the water is always 40 degrees Celsius, not slightly higher, uh, and the corals still don't bleach, uh, show us how to save the world's reefs, right? There are a lot of stuff that I think, um, if we really start to pull threads at and understand from a chemical perspective, at the ecosystem level, um, how these corals are actually modulating and responding to stressors in ways that we don't quite understand yet. We can't write them all off as easy as, as we think. Um, okay, so with that, um, I will go ahead and wrap up. There's a whole village of sports of people I'd like to thank um, that led me to this point. Um, and then also, I always like to end a talk like this by highlighting this picture, uh, where in my second year of graduate school, um, I had the fortune of doing field work on Tetsiroa, which is in French Polynesia again, um, and a vacationing Barack Obama just happened to drop by and talk to us. Um, <laughs> for an hour about ocean acidification research, which was awesome. So I always say it was like, okay, well, like, yes, I'm a faculty member. I'm excited to be here, but this is by far my peak. I don't think I'll ever get back to something like this. Um, and so with that, thank you for listening um, and I'll take any questions you have. <laughs>